This is the Power of Teen America podcast, and today we've got an interview with Meg Scanlon, one of the most decorated powerlifters of this era. She's fresh off of winning the silver medal at this year's IPF World Championships, where she added a whopping 27.5 kilos to her total from last year. She's always very generous and inspiring in her interviews, dropping tons of knowledge that we can all learn from. She talks about all the things she's doing to keep getting stronger, including her mental strength and how having fun helps her perform her best. She gives a full recap of the World Championships this year and talks about her plan for the future. This is a great interview. Meg is just the best, so don't miss this one. Before we start, we're just under two weeks out from the North American Championships starting on August eight in the Cayman Islands. We're bringing a stacked team with 108 Power of the America athletes. We're also about five weeks out from the Sub-Junior and Junior World Championships in Romania starting August 24th, where we'll have a loaded team to compete against the world's best. Our media team will be at both competitions doing press conferences, interviews, behind-the-scenes coverage, and more. Subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Instagram, Power of the underscore America, so you don't miss any of it. Show your support for the squad. Get a Power of the America shirt or hat from the store link below. Thank you to SBD and Aleco for their continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in direct as a Powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure to go to powerlifting-america.com and become a member. Now let's get to this interview with Meg Scanlon. Okay, here we are. We've got the best 63 kilo lifter in America, the world's second best this year, and the 2022 world champion, Meg Scanlon. How are you doing, Meg? I'm doing well. So... Tell us, uh, what did you do after Malta? Well, I did a whole lot of nothing for a while <laughs> in terms <laughs> of lifting. No, I mean, like, you know, I, uh, I actually like enjoyed some time off, um, which I haven't done in a really long time without being, you know, like pregnant or something. So it was, it was good. Uh, I just kind of started training last week and I was ready for it, which is kind of what I wanted to wait for, you know, like miss training yeah. a bit. So did you guys take like a vacation or anything or, or did you travel at all? We, we spent like one more day in Malta and then we had a layover in Paris that we like extended into like 36 hours and then we had it home. So just oh. like a, a sh very short, quick, uh, <laughs> little trip, but you know, we'd already been away for a week and it's like hard for, for to spend more time than that right now. Um, with the How girls, is it? So. Yeah. I mean, what is it like, like being away from the girls for you? Like, um, because you're, I think besides worlds in South Africa and now this world's in Malta and then your trip to Australia, like you really haven't been apart from them. No, it's true. So it's literally only the powerlifting trips <laughs> that I've been apart from them. And, um, it used to stress me out a lot, <laughs> like, you know, the first national that I went to, um, was kind of like the first time I left them. And then obviously worlds in South Africa. Um, not that it gets easier, but you realize like, Hey, it's, it's going to work out, you know, like it's going to be okay. It's almost like a practice, like anything else. Um, and they're also getting older and can communicate better. So that's also helpful. Cause you know, that they are kind of getting what they need to, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyways, how, how long until we see them at the, uh, at a powerlifting meet that you're competing at? I know it's funny. I actually, I really kind of want them to come to nationals next year, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I think it'll be cool. Um, yeah. and so like it, will you have like grandparents, uh, you know, sort of babysitting them because Brian will have to be in the warm up room. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. So you definitely need someone to come with us. Um, the past couple of years, my parents have come out to Austin. So yeah. perhaps, you know, um, might as well, might as well bring, bring them along as well. <laughs> um, it is one of those things though, that like, you know, I am their primary caretaker and like their person. So if they're coming, like it's going to change my, how I treat yeah. them at, uh, days leading up. But in a way it's like, that's how I train anyway. So it's no different. <laughs> it's going to affect our post comp celebrations. <laughs> that's the only concern hey, that I have. <laughs> not if I'm bringing grandparents, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, true. That's true. They can't yet come out to, uh, the club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. The, the, uh, kids and the Kelly man crew going out afterwards is not going to mix. Not quite. Um, <laughs> so what's your process after competitions, um, for getting back into the gym and getting back into training? Like what are the, what's the strategy that you use for, you know, getting back into training? I know you, you have like a really like an athlete background. So you, mm -hmm. you like to get right back in there fast, but like, what are the type of things you do when you first get back into the gym? So it, typically speaking, um, generally speaking the past, I would say forever, especially the past year and a half, um, that I've been working with Kelly, I've pretty much got back in the next Monday and like hopped right back into training, granted lighter, less volume, sometimes mixing it up a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but haven't really taken any break from 
kind of traditional training. And a lot of that is like, we were just trying to figure things out and trying to rework some things. Um, so kind of like, you can't waste any time type of deal. And because we were always almost prepping for the next meet and this time, you know, world is in June and I'm not planning on competing the rest of the year. So we have some time. Um, so I got back in, you know, to the gym, I don't know, maybe a week later and just kind of messing around, like doing some fun stuff. I lifted a stone, like I'm a think I'm a strong man or something, you know, did my, <laughs> did my yearly clean, see if I could still clean the barbell uh, <laughs> and just like, feel like I'm a has been athlete, you know, uh, yeah. haven't lost it all, but I'm much more of a power lifter these days. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. You know, it's better. And, uh, it's better sport. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I just started training again, like officially on a training program this week. So that's about a month almost, um, of kind of just messing around between peaking uh, the competition and then, and then a little vacation, a little time off. And then, so when you say you just started back this week, um, that means you're back on with Kelly has program stuff. Now she didn't program the clean. No, she didn't program the clean or the stone. <laughs> <laughs> was she mad My about only, those? No, nah, she knew, she knew I was going to do some, she's yeah. like, just don't do anything too crazy. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay. I won't, I won't. Um, so yeah, no, she didn't, she didn't program the, the clean. <laughs> and then, so like, what does your program look like, like for like this first week and then like the next week or so, like, is it a lot lighter? Is it like a lot of like sets of nine and stuff or what is it? So I do have some, you know, bigger sets. Uh, I bargained for sets of 10 rather than oh. 12. Oh, oh okay. Oh, yeah. 12. So okay. a little bit less. So 10 reps instead of 12, but definitely like last week it was a low volume. Like I didn't do many sets of my higher volume, you know, higher rep things. And the weight's definitely a little bit less working back in kind of slow. Um, cause like, again, there's no necessarily rush here in terms of getting back. So I've learned from my past, uh, <laughs> past self. Uh, so it took last week to kind of just take what felt really good. Um, and just build off that. And do you, do you, the two of you, do you use like RPE or does she prescribe a specific weight? A little bit of both for squat. It's almost all RP at this point for my squats. Mm -hmm. Um, deadlift is primarily RP for anything that is a top set. Um, and sometimes my volume work is more prescribed and then bench is usually a mixture. Um, depending on the day, um, a prescribed and RPE work. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's cool, just good to hear like a little bit of insights behind the scenes training. Like you, like you're, you're obviously your numbers are shooting up. Kelly is like a superstar coach right now. Everyone probably wants to work with her after the performances that you've been having. Um, so it's cool to just pull the curtain back and see a little bit of like how you guys do things. And I know yeah. when go going back to like the stone and the clean, she wants you to have, <laughs> she wants you to have fun, right? Like yeah. that's a big thing with your training is that she wants to keep you engaged and just having fun and enjoying yourself. So it's good to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So, um, your next competition, hopefully mm -hmm. fingers crossed is going to be Sheffield February 10th. All right. We're I gonna mean, put it, it would be cool. You, you did everything necessary to qualify, right? Um, mm -hmm. as far as getting, I mean, you didn't win, but you hit the right. qualifying total. You got 90, within 95% of the world record total everything, all the other criteria is met for you to be able to get a wild card. Mm -hmm. Um, so hopefully February 10th will be your next competition, um, Sheffield. If not, it'll be PA Nats, which will, we don't know exactly the date, but probably like a month after. Um, so yeah. So as we're going through this, if anyone's listening, um, we'll kind of build out a case here <laughs> for, for Meg Scanlon to get a wild card for Sheffield. Um, so let's talk about it. You're fresh off the world championships in Malta. Mm -hmm. You put up a huge 532 and a half kilo total. Mm -hmm. You, I believe PR'd your squat, PR'd your deadlift, mm -hmm. hit a, hit a new bench rule, bench PR. Mm -hmm. Um, and you were the only 63 kilo lifter to medal in all three individual events, taking silver overall contributed valuable team points, you know, which came down to a tie in team points with team France. So if you had not finished in second place, team USA would not have finished in first place in the team points. So that was massive. Um, so congratulations again on this like epic performance. Like this is, this is a, 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 an amazing performance. Um, now that it's had time to sink in a little bit, cause you know, mm -hmm. obviously we asked you about it right after in the post-competition press conference, I just posted the highlights of your press conference on Instagram today. 
Um, now that it's had a chance to sink in, what do you, how do you feel overall about, you know, your performance at the world championships? I mean, my performance, like after it's sinking in is still like, I could, that's exactly what I was looking for, you know? And I know I said it in the pre pre meet, right? Like yeah. I'm looking to have a good day and have some fun. And I think yeah. the rest will take care of itself. Um, and it, at this point, it's just because I believe in what I can do, you know, and I know what I'm capable of. And I feel very prepared. Like, it's not like I'm hoping it's going to be there on meet day type of deal, if you will. Um, and afterwards I just, it was some of the most fun I've ever had. Um, and I'm cut and I left the platform being like, and I'm not done yet, you know, like dot, dot, dot. Like, I feel like for some reason, and I feel like I've said this to you before, like for some reason, people always think like, well, and if you listen to some podcasts, well, she's, you know, she's not 25 and it's like, no, I'm 35, but mm-hmm. I'm still getting stronger. And like, I've proven that meat over meat. And not only am I getting stronger, I'm getting more consistent in my performances. Yeah. So if you look through my performances and really, if you want to even take out, which I know you can't take out performances, but if you take out nationals from this year, where between being sick and having some things happen in life that were unpredictable. My yeah. performances have been very consistent. Um, you know, once we've figured out what works for me. Um, and I think that's cool. And I think that the confidence I have in myself as a lifter has grown because of that. And like, I have s- still yet to see my best total that I will see in my lifetime on the platform. Like, I think that is without a doubt, I can say that as a statement. Yeah. I mean, that's so that's, that's one of the things I think is just so exciting about where you're at right now, because we don't, you, I mean, not to knock the other podcasts and things like this. I mean, that's a, that's a very common theme in sports talk is like, Oh, so-and-so is getting into their thirties. Like you do, you talk about this in football, basketball, all these Mm -hmm. things that where is the ceiling? They're eventually going to have a drop off. And Mm -hmm. with you, it just seems like, and, and especially in the last, let's say year and a half, um, even maybe going back two years since the pandemic, you just making stride after stride after stride, like your total is going up, like you're a junior or something. Um, mm-hmm. like everyone is talking about Callie Johansson's total was going up 20 kilos. I mean, your t- total went up like over 20 kilos, um, since the last world championships. So, right. and you know, you're a mom, you're a huge inspiration for everyone out there, um, showing that you can continue to build onto your total, um, even into your thirties and things like this. And I just love like you're, you're fired up about it and it's obvious, like you're having fun and the total is just going up and up. Yeah. I mean, I think a part of it is and why I get fired up about it is it's like, don't just discredit like the work I've put in just because I'm 35. Yeah. I think most times, and even if you look at things like you can see, like for a lot of people, strength peaks actually like in their mid ish thirties. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, that's where I am. I'm approaching maybe that point, but a lot of times you don't see, especially women's women's women in their, you know, mid to late thirties competing because of life, like, because a lot of females may be pregnant and or having babies. Um, and I think that is a unique situation, you know, and I think that's something that has happened before, but it's not necessarily happened since, the growth of powerlifting, the explosion of social media, and really like powerlifting taking off and like the totals in powerlifting and the total you need to have to be competitive and to win exploding really over the past five or six years. And what's crazy. And I think what I take a lot of pride in is somehow, and I think it's just because like, I'm actually (laughs) built to be a strength athlete rather than what I was trying to do before. Um, I've been able to kind of like keep pace with the explosion of the numbers. Like Mm -hmm. these weren't always my numbers. You know, when I was in my late twenties, I was totaling like four sixty. Yeah. you know? Yeah. exactly. Um, so I've been able to kind of grow as the sport has grown and it's Mm -hmm. just so happened that I started in my late twenties. Um, and now I'm in my mid thirties, but yeah. It's like, I think sometimes you, you know, you hear about this, like in football, like um, a running back that like doesn't play a year comes back the next year and is fresh. And it's sort yeah. of like, it's your playing age as well. Whereas, sure. so there was a lot of time when you were doing other things and, you know, your coaching was right. different and like, and like, I feel like now you've sort of put all the p- pieces together yeah. and you're just like, let's run it back again. Let's run it yeah. back again. Um, this recipe that works. Yeah. And we're just seeing the results here. I mean, like, like right. you went from, you know, 505 to 532.5, like, and that's with a major 
hit on hit your bench. On bench. Right. Right. So, yeah. Um, so it's crazy. Cause if you think about it, like I'm just coming up on two years, like this say October will be two years of strictly being a power lifter and refining that process, both in yeah. programming and competing and like how, you know, training. Right. So yeah, I've been doing this for a while. I've been in strength sports, strength sports for a while, but as a power lifter, like my training life or whatever you want to call it training age is like relatively young and refining that process is relatively young. And -hmm. I think that's why I've seen such huge, huge gains in my total since I've started with Kelly, despite the fact, like you're saying, like I took a huge hit on my bench, like, you know, uh, but also for me having children in a lot of ways was like a reset button for me athletically. Yeah. Uh, both in how I was approaching things and also my mindset. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So although it may seem like a time where perhaps you shouldn't be adding a lot of kilos onto your total, yeah. I think because it forced me to change my approach in a lot of things, it has allowed me to then kind of grow. Well, how did you change your approach? And then like, how, you know, how do you think like, I know we, so shout out our previous episode, um, which was a super long, <laughs> like three hour, probably episode. Yeah, yeah. People should go back and listen. There's so many gems in there. So many things that people can take away and, and can learn from, but how did, I, I know you mentioned before it was like the pandemic and also having kids like helped reframe your mindset towards powerlifting. What, what switch do you think that you flipped since having kids that, that kind of, um, you know, that, that you were just mentioned, like you've reframed your mindset. Yeah. I mean, I think it has a lot to do with my identity. Right. So, and I know, I think I've mentioned this before and we probably talked about it in the last podcast, but prior my identity was so intertwined with powerlifting and being a powerlifter and being an athlete being a, I mean, I was weightlifting too. Um, and good days and bad days affected me very much, you know, very much. Cause I took it like personally, right. Like, yeah. <laughs> like the barbell is doing it to me personally, or you're going to have good days and bad days, but like not being mature enough as an athlete to realize like, that's all it is. It doesn't mean you're weaker one day. It doesn't mean you're a worse athlete one day. Um, but sometimes you're just going to have a strong day and sometimes you're going to have a weekday in training. And that's because there's so many other factors that affect it. Um, and now like I identify myself as a power lifter, but it's a part of me rather than like the whole entire being. Um, and it's allowed me to enjoy the sport like so much more and just be like more flexible with myself. Um, within the framework of the sport. And it, do you think that's just because now it's like, you think like there's more important things in life. Like you got two mm-hmm. girls running around, you know, you got a family and everything like this. And so it just kind of puts powerlifting a little bit more in perspective of like, it's more of like, it's, it's a luxury that I get to do this. hundred percent. And I think for a lot of things, like having children have definitely put in perspective, but it's also forced me in all aspects of my life to learn how to roll the punches a little bit more. Uh-huh. Um, like I used to, you know, be very, like, I have my schedule. This is what I have to do, blah, blah, blah. And now it's like, no. And you know what, if it doesn't happen like that, it's okay. Cause it's about getting it done rather than it happening perfectly. And I think that's helped me a lot in training and on meet days, because there's a lot of times where things don't go perfectly and you kind of let it just have to let it roll off your shoulders. Um, yeah. and it doesn't mean you can't perform. Yeah, absolutely. It just mean it looks different. It's amazing how these little toddlers can teach lessons and stuff, it's right? Crazy. I mean, like they're teach they're, they're great teachers. Um, and obviously you're going to be a great, a great mentor for them as well. But, um, all right. So getting back to your performance, do you know yeah. that with your total that you had five thirty two and a half, and a half, you would have finished second in both the 63s and the 69s? I did know that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you would have tied, you basically would have <laughs> tied Jenner uh, for second place in the 69s and obviously won on body weight. Right. Um, you Take also, that BW advantage again. Yeah, he's a huge, huge body weight advantage <laughs> if you had competed in the 69s. <laughs> um, you would have taken silver on squat, gold on bench on body weight, um, tying our girl Chelsea. Um, mm-hmm. And ninth on deadlift. What's what's up with the deadlift? Wolf. I mean, come, come on, on man. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get you on that, the 69 podium on deadlifts. Ninth. You know, it sounds like a lot like how my deadlift used to be in general. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Bottom. I used to open up every single fight on deadlifts, uh, regardless of my weight class. Um, yeah. It's coming. Yeah, yeah. I, so, it's I mean, coming. what just, I mean, does that, does that, how does that feel to be like, I mean, I could have just competed a weight class up and still finished in second place, again, you know, just like you did in the 63s. 
I mean, not for nothing, it would have made my percentage of the Sheffield total higher. Just saying. Oh, exactly. See, <laughs> see that's why I'm bringing, the this is part of the sales record, pitch. The, oh, I know, right? So it's very interesting right now. And someone just actually asked me this question on Instagram, which makes it even more interesting. But yeah, I think the 63 and 69 weight class right now is very interesting because the top end is very similar. Yeah, There's just more people in the 69 class that will total between, you know, say over 500 yes. in the yeah. top end of the weight class. Right. Absolutely. And like, so for the 63s, I think there was three of us that totaled four of us that totaled, sorry, over 500. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in the 69s, I believe it was nine people. Yeah. I'm going to pull it up right now. Um, in the 69s. Yeah, it was. Yep. Nine. Exactly. Um, Iris was in ninth place with a 500. Uh, I believe, let me just make sure. Yep. Iris. And Here's I think, Shelton. and then in, um, there in was the four six, of us, right? Like Joy totaled, I think like 505, yep, maybe. Joy totaled 505. Yep. And um, place. so, yeah, exactly. I mean, like not, I mean, Chelsea um, and uh, Clara Perot was like, they, they would have been right on. I mean, it would have yeah. been, would have been a battle for that, for that podium spot there. Like, I think in that class, in fact, in the 69s, it was decided the, between Body second weight, place think. yeah no it was right. a between second place and fourth place only two and a half kilo difference yeah um, it's just much closer together yeah at 530 um, think, which is a big total yeah i think eventually there'll be a, a more drastic top end between the two yeah. but i think when they split the weight classes from the 72 you know 63 to 72 a lot of the 72s that were at the top end of that weight class just went up like i feel like not many yeah. people dropped down and they're there were 63s that went up to 69 per se, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's like the totals, I think, will end up being more drastic eventually over time, um, which I think we're seeing in a lot of the other weight classes where, you know, 500 used to be a big total in the 63 weight class, and it still is a big total, but it's not winning it for you. No. <laughs> not even no, close. Definitely. No, definitely not. Not anymore. Um, and and the same, same thing, like 57s, like a big total used to be, 470. Now it's yeah. not, you're not even going to, you know, like, oh, you, gotta be over you gotta be over 500 yeah. there as well. Um, yeah, that's like the 57s are like the new 63s with the totals. Like you gotta be over 500. I mean, the 76 is same thing, like Carlina yeah. going 600. I mean, you gotta be damn near 600 to be competitive there. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, I do think you're right though. Like the other thing is, is that Leah obviously is kind of, you know, won by a lot in the, in the 69s. She's got a huge total and she's, she only weighed in at 65. So right. really, for the 60s, I mean, kind of classifying her as a 63 still, because she only weighed in at 65. It's really a three person show right now. Corolla, Leah, and you. Um, does it make it any more special for you that you're in the mix with, you know, two who some people would say are overall the best lifters in powerlifting across in the entire sport right now, men, mm -hmm. women, otherwise Leah and Corolla are, you know, um, among the greatest right now in mm -hmm. the game. Um, so does that, does it feel a little bit like, sp like special era right now that it's like, it's Leah, it's Corolla and it's Meg Scanlon in this like 63, 69 universe. Um, I think it's really cool. You know what I mean? And I think, I think for me personally, um, where I've kind of been, like you're saying on this last year going into worlds, I was like, I think I can you know, I think I can come in second. Like I didn't, you know, I, I don't, didn't think I was going to beat Leah. Like I'm a very realistic person, but I think I can come in second in total. Honestly, I thought my top end was way more than it was that I put up yeah. <laughs> that day, but let's not mention that. Things um, happen. right. Things happen. But I, in my head, I was like, I think by the end of this year, I can total five thirty. right. Mm -hmm. By the end of the year, I totaled five, right? yep. 537.5. Um, and I was like, you know what? I think that I'll be able to total, like, I think I'll be able to total 550 soon, right? Mm -hmm. Granted, bench roll change, all of that. We get to Worlds this year and I'm getting back to my old total without my bench yet, right? Yeah. But after Worlds, I'm like, you know what? This bench thing is clicking. Once my bench comes back, I think I'm going to be able to total over 550, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and like, that sounds crazy because you're like, girl, you put up 532, that's far way off. It's like, yes, I understand what you're saying. But I did it with a 527 bench and yes. like the bench, how I'm benching now. And I think anyone that watched me bench, like it's not the end of my bench. It's no. just starting to come back. Like um, you said it, in the press conference, you got quick kilos coming yeah. on that bench. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really finding 
what was going to work, changing the programming, and then finding consistency with the reps, getting the reps under my belt so that I could get my training numbers back up um, in the volume, like build the volume back and starting to build the volume back will push my top end up again. Yeah. So it's just like a process, you know? No, of course. I mean, you're, I, I believe your total is going to go up quite a bit still, but I mean, just like, I yeah. just think it's, do you, how do you, how do you view yourself, you know, kind of like in this, in the, in the world of powerlifting, um, with these two others that I think pretty much unanimously people think are among the best of the best. Do mm -hmm. you think that you're in good company or do you think they're in good company having Meg Scanlon there with you? <laughs> uh, okay. How do you well, feel as I mean, an athlete? Like, like, like yeah. because as an athlete, you're like, Oh, I keep hearing about, Le but what about Meg sure. Scanlon? Right? Sure. Sure. Well, I think I'm in like this weird, like in between right now, you know what I mean? Like I'm the chaser without a doubt. Like I yeah. am the chaser. I feel like I'm the pusher. Like I, I, I think probably in their back of their head, I hope at least they like have to think about me. Right. Cause like, if yeah. you screw up, like I'm still here, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's who I am right now. Like if you, you have to think like, I still have to perform, you know, mm -hmm. but in my head, I'm like, wait another year, give me another year. Like we're going to battle, you know, like I'm going to be someone that battles with you and you're yeah. going to have to deal with me. And it doesn't matter who comes out on top because it's going to be a good day, you know? And like, that's what I think is exciting. And that's what I think is like totally possible, yeah. um, coming out of world and like reviewing and thinking about what happened in training and how my performance went and where we can go from here and what we can build on. Yeah. Um, and that to me is super cool. And I know it's coming. Um, and I think it's coming pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Um, I mean, there's two things that separate you, I think from those other two ladies, which I mean, like I've been giving them a lot of praise. I mean, they're amazing. Yeah. They're superstars yeah, yeah. in the sport. Um, the, the, the first thing is that, you're the lightest of the three. You're only mm -hmm. now moving and filling out fully the 63 weight class, right? Yeah. Like what was your cut like um, for Malta? It, I mean, Not I really, it wasn't much of a cut. Yeah, no. Yeah. And I mean, I just heard uh, Corolla on the King of the Lifts podcast talking about it was extremely difficult for her to get down to 63. Mm. Um, we see Leah obviously had problems last year. Mm -hmm. Um, and then now is just going 69, slowly going to be filling out that 69 kilo weight class. Um, so, I mean, you're putting up numbers that are getting you competitive with those ladies, but at a significantly lower body weight. So I mm -hmm. think the first thing would be like, if we can get you up to like 65 and have you cutting to 63, you're going to be able to, you know, approach the world record. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I fit very well within the 63 weight class. Um, yeah. and it's funny because when I first started powerlifting, I didn't, I was no. a very small 63, exactly. uh, but now I do fit very well within the 63 weight class. Uh, people always ask me, they're like, are you going to go 69? I'm like, listen, I look at my weigh in this year. It was perfect. All right. And yeah, I was like, yeah. I just pulled out the 63 weight class and I'm very proud of that. Um, but I'm also not opposed to eventually going 69 when the time is right. You know, I yeah. think it's something that, um, I have also realized that if you have the capability of going up a weight class where you're going to put on more muscle and going to have usable body weight or it's time, like you're going to see results, <laughs> you yeah. know, but absolutely. Yeah. And I, I know I heard you say, you know, that you're, you eventually probably will go to 69. Uh, it's just a matter of time. If you keep just like adding on muscle and packing on more and more muscle, you, you're going to have to go 69. Um, if you get the Sheffield invite, it would be amazing because I think based on what I'm hearing, I mean, obviously the 69 kilo world record is lower than the 63. So it's based on percentage of world record is that's how the payouts go. So probably what would happen is all three of you, Leah, Corolla, and yourself will all go 69. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, and you would just, I mean, you have now until February to add on more weight and get like up to like 65 or something like that. But I mean, that would basically be all three of you, like in your absolute prime, like peaked performance, that would be an epic showdown. A zero a three, cutting. A three-way three battle, <laughs> zero cutting. Zero everyone's cutting. coming in carved up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone's coming in with carbs and just like ready to perform. Right. Yeah. So like, we would see like the, the most epic performance of all time, like with the three of you there. I mean, it would be amazing. Mm -hmm. It would be cool. And I mean, that's what people want to see. They don't want to see people cutting and they want to see people carved up, ready to go and to yes. just have a day. Right. That's when throwing you around some massive yeah. weights. I mean, we might be talking, what are we like going into the five sixties here? Um, okay. So the other thing that sets you apart, um, from Leah and Corolla 
is you're the only one that's a mom. I thought you were going to be like, you're the only one that's over 30. (laughs) uh, I don't think, no, I think Leah might be. No, Leah's 30. 30. She's 30, I think. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, And and I don't know about Corolla either. I don't think, I don't know how old she is, but I mean, I think that makes you the strongest mom in the world, right? I mean, I can't think of any other moms at the world championships. Can you? Um, I mean, I know a few, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. It is a special superpower. Um, and yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take strongest mom in the world. Yeah. Strongest mom (laughs) in the world. Um, and also just amongst these three ladies, I mean, you're doing it at sort of a lighter body weight and you're doing it as a mom. I mean, it's amazing. So, um, obviously they got huge totals and everything. So they have that to brag on, but we can brag about the fact that you're a mom and yeah, you're doing it at a lighter body weight. So that's super cool. All right. Um, let's you know what get else in- I think I have going for me. I got a good what one. Else? Okay. What I've else? added the most totals to my, to my, no nope, kilos to my total probably Absolute. in the past year. Right. Definitely. Um, because <laughs> I think Leah totaled one kilo more than she did, um, in like the last world what what would that have been like 2020 worlds or something like that i was looking that up recently Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. yeah so but of course you know she didn't take her third deadlift so who knows yeah but yeah definitely you've been adding a lot more um you had a lot more room to grow definitely on your on your total as well coming into this um all right so similar kind of theme here question what was your mentality like like going against one of the greats i mean in corolla gara everyone you know she's she's already won a world title in this weight class she won Mm -hmm. world games um she's just one of the greatest you know in the sport was there anything did it change anything for you having i mean because you already had to deal with mentally going into south africa against leah last year Mm -hmm. another one of the greats. so is was it any different or how was their mindset different this year versus last year it really wasn't different outside of this year i feel like i'm just more confident in myself as a lifter Mm -hmm. um both like with what I can lift, but just in general, like comfortable on the platform and confident with myself as a lifter, but it doesn't change my mindset. Again, like I'm very realistic. Like I figured if Corolla is healthy, she's coming in, she's going to put up a huge total, you know? And like this year I could do my best and I'm not going to total that. And that's okay. Cause that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. Um, so to me, I just went in to the day thinking like, how cool is it? First of all, I'm getting to share a platform with one of the best lifters, if yeah. not arguably the best lifter of all time. Right. Yeah. Um, especially if you're going to consider raw and equipped. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and I just wanted to put on my own show, you know, like have my own good time and put up my own show. And that was kind of my goal going into world. So it didn't necessarily change how I approached the day. Okay. That's, I figured that that that's okay. Yeah, totally. That's very, I mean, like there's a healthy amount of respect. It's like, like you said, it's kind of like, it's an honor to share the platform with these great athletes, but, um, it doesn't really change the fact that you're Meg Scanlon, you're there, you're there to handle business. Um, you said in the press conference afterwards that in the past, you were always trying to prove that you belong there in the past. Mm -hmm. And you were trying to prove to yourself, maybe you're trying to prove to others as well, but now you, you said, now, you know, you belong there. When did that change? Like what, what went into the changing of that mindset? When do you think that you, you kind of like mentally were like, Hey, I do belong here. Yeah. Honestly, I think world in South Africa. Um, Mm -hmm. and in a lot of ways, like winning a world is really cool. Right. But in a lot of ways I was like, um, going into that meet, like I, did I really belong at worlds, you know, like, was I strong enough to be here? And that might sound silly given the fact that I had a good, like I PR'd my total and I ended up winning, but at the same point in time, it was just like, I just didn't know. And it's sometimes like what other people may tell you or what you're telling yourself, the narrative. And for me, that narrative at the time was like, Hey, like, should you be doing this? You're, you're a new mom of twins. Like, is this the right thing? Like, should you still be pursuing, um, trying to be an elite powerlifter type of deal? Um, but after South Africa and obviously like it was an interesting and it was a tough day in South Africa. Um, but it was one that 
and I know I've talked about this before was like very cathartic for me, like in, in terms of like, it brought like a lot of my whole entire experience, experience of powerlifting to kind of like light and why I was doing it. And the fact that like, I did belong on that platform, good day or a bad day. And like, I could do even better type of deal. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas before I was always wondering, like, am I just, um, like fighting for more where there's no more left? you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, which that's just so crazy to think because you, you basically damn near won a world title, um, as a 57 before until, yeah. you know, miracles happen. Um, but so, I mean, it's, it's, I think this is what's so cool about you. You're so open, um, in sharing your experience and like, and like what you're thinking about, um, and your confidence and like your mindset stuff. Um, because I mean, you, you had accomplished a ton in the sport already before yeah. you went to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting. Like I ended up winning a a world championship at a time. I didn't think I was going to, didn't have the best day per se. Um, and then two times I went to worlds and had on paper, pretty stellar days and came in second. Right. So it's also like finding the satisfaction in what you're doing rather than necessarily like how you're finishing. Uh, Because I've always said this, but I think until like after South Africa, I really started more of like living it of like, you have to care more about what you're doing and like take care of your own business because that's what's going to allow you to see success. Right. Um, So like I, people could think about it in a lot of ways, but like I went to Worlds this year and in Malta, I had a a great freaking day. Right. Like I, had a great performance. I PR'd. I had a lot of fun. Like I did everything I showed up to do. Now it's Mm -hmm. like, I could be super excited and have a lot of fun and do that. Or I could think, Oh, well, I came in second and I'm 23 kilos from Corolla, Yeah, you know, and my past self would have thought that you would have been comparing yourself, your total to her, but really the comparison is 532.5 versus 505 a year before. Right. I mean, exactly. That, and again, with the ventral thing, there's like a little asterisk in there too, because you could definitely have more. Um, that's amazing. I mean, that's just, that's such a healthier mindset. And I mm-hmm. think that's just one thing that like, you got to just keep preaching this because I feel like um, so many athletes, especially younger athletes, like we're about seven weeks out from junior, the junior world championships. And I see a lot of these lifters kind of falling down that path of like comparing themselves, um, being super impatient. Mm-hmm. And you're such a role model for like patience, like, like wait until you turn 35 kids. Yeah. That's when you're going to have your best total. Right. <laughs> it's true. But some of it's life experience, you know, and, yeah. and I get it. Cause I, again, like that you see things and you see people lifting certain weights. Um, but what you don't realize when you might be in your early twenties is some of these people lifting weights, they might not be lifting weights in a year. So like you keep doing your thing. And if you're enjoying it and you're staying in your process, you're going to get better. And some of those other people, they might not they might burn out, you know, and like things are going to happen. But if you stay within your own process and stay true to what is going well for you, like you're going to continue to see success. You're going to get better. And at the end of the day, that's all you can ask for. You can't control what anyone else is going to do, or if there's going to be some genetic freak that shows up and, you know, like changes the total that's going to win it by 20 kilos. You can't predict that. But if you show up and you're doing 20 kilos more than you did last year, like that's freaking awesome. And like, that's all you can do. Um, and honestly, my, the other big performance that changed it for me was in Sweden when I lost. Um, and it was like, everyone came up and was like, Oh, like, I'm really sorry. Like type of deal. And I was like, you know what? Like, yeah, of course I wanted to win. I'm very competitive. Like, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, (laughs) but I had a stellar day. I PR'd my total by like, 12 or 15 kilos or something like, I can't be mad about that. Yeah. You know, um, I can be upset about other things that maybe I wanted to change, but I can't be mad about that. Like I showed up and left everything I had on the platform. Mm -hmm. And I think people like as athletes, if you kind of accept that and just try to focus on yourself, it doesn't mean that you're not competitive or you don't want to win or that, you know, you're giving any less effort. Cause I think that's sometimes what people feel like, like if I admit I'm showing up and I want to do X, Y, and Z, and I want to do the best I can do, but it doesn't mean I'm going to win Yeah. that like automatically it's like, Oh, you don't really like 
care. You're, you know, you're not, yeah. you don't want to be competitive or win. And like, it's just not true. Like there's, you got to be realistic about it too. And there's that give and the take, you know? And, and it's both, it's both things. You Both things can be true. Like you can be, I want to win, but I'm also yeah. really happy finishing second with a 532 and a half total at the same time. Like, like you can have both thoughts in your head at the same time. Yeah, of course. And, and it, I think like also a lot of what you're saying is like, you need to enjoy the process um, mm-hmm. and don't get so caught up just in the final result or because it's yes. not the final result. The, it's like it can, the process continues on after the comp. Can I tell you something funny? I think I told you this, but I thought I came in third this year. No. I, Did I tell I, you I, that? <laughs> I don't yeah. remember. Even during the competition itself, yep. you thought you finished in third win. Like I sure did. You... After I finished, yeah. Until like, the awards. Until the awards, Paul. Really? No yeah. I, way. Yeah. So I finished and obviously I deadlifted before Kiara. I was not paying attention to anybody else. I was I know. like, they have it. You ran in back the in the warm up. You you ran back in the warm up room. I was following you. I had no idea what was happening either. Um, yeah, it was, was crazy. Like, you were so happy. You were so I was happy. so happy. I was like elated because I was like, you know what? I did everything I came here to do. Yeah. You know, I PR'd my squat, I PR'd my deadlift. We figured out how we're gonna make bench work. Like I came here to do everything. I came here to do, I went eight for nine. We had a great day. Yeah. Kiara pulled after me and she made her third pull. And you just assumed she was pulling for, yes. I just assumed she was pulling for a second because I wasn't paying attention to any of the numbers Mm. and literally until the award ceremony, when they announced the bronze medal total, I was like, that's not my total. Yeah. (laughs) And then I proceeded to tell Brian and Kelly this, and they both made fun of me and they were like, didn't you realize she was like in front of you on squats and in bench? And I'm like, no, like I, Yes, but I didn't realize what she was lifting. Essentially, yeah. I just figured like you guys are taking care of the numbers. I'm just my job is just to lift. <laughs> I love that. I mean, you were in the zone. You were, um, you know, really focused just on yourself, and um, and you were having so much fun. Like I said, I mean, that's amazing. That I think you might have mentioned something about. I think I you did tell me this afterwards, um, but it's just following you back into the warm up room and you were like talking and you were just like, Oh my God, I'm so happy. And like, blah, 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 all this stuff. And then, um, I just assumed you knew that you finished yeah, literally you know, no idea. way in yeah. second place. I mean, you won, you, you beat Kiara by 12 and a half kilos. So it was like, it wasn't really close. So that's why yeah. I guess no one thought to really tell you. Tell me, yeah. Hey, by the way. Yeah. And then Brian was like, you were that happy. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> you were that happy with finishing third. Wow. That is I was like, I was only a little testament. mad. You wouldn't throw on a little, like another two and a half or something on my deadlift if I really needed it. But yeah, it's fine. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, all right. Well, that kind of like draws into my next question, uh, which is just like, you know, you were having a ton of fun on the competition day. Um, how do you keep that energy? I, th- I don't think I saw like I was in the warm up room for every single session except for the 52s. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe Evie has the same kind of energy. I don't know, but I don't, I didn't see anyone else that is like a podium level finisher, um, having as much fun as you did, um, throughout mm-hmm. the competition. So like, how do you stay in that zone and stay focused, especially because like we, I'll, I'll go ahead and just, I'll bring it up, but I mean, you're warming up on the same platform as Taylor Atwood. Um, Mm -hmm. you're in, you know, obviously his vibe and your vibe were complete opposites. Like he was, it was, it was like, I I was talking with Delaney about this, like during Taylor's session, like I just had this gut feeling like things weren't going right. Like his squat, like with the third squat getting overturned. Um, and just like, you just kind of had this feeling of like, he, he had a certain type of energy, um, that was very intense and very, you know, sort of like um, just, just super focus and like n- the opposite of yours, not, not happy, not, not bubbly, not like having a good time. Like he wasn't, he didn't seem like he was having a good time because obviously things weren't going his way. And mm-hmm. there was just this sinking feeling like in a lot of our stomachs during your session because of what was going on with Taylor. Um, so how do you like, you know, and we're warming up on that platform way in the back corner, which was like, a. I think Taylor had chose that platform. You wanted to be far away from yeah. the foot traffic and all of that kind of stuff. And like, just how do you um, compartmentalize all of that and just like handle and then just like not let it affect your mentality? Well, I have a lot of practice compartmentalizing when I have to train with, <laughs> with the, with the girls <laughs> in the gym. Yeah. Um, but I also think like, 
although we approach meet day very di- differently and listen, like this is the first time I've ever warmed up on the same platform as Taylor. And mm-hmm. I know a lot of things did not go his way. So I don't know what it's like for him on say a more typical day. Right. Yeah. yeah. But we trained, we trained, uh, our last training session together just by chance, you know, like we had the same time slot for the training in Malta, in the training in Malta. Hall. Yeah. In the training hall. And it was funny. Cause like, as we're training, I was like, you know what, this is going to work out well. Like we, we approach like training and like, you can just tell like very similar, like this is going to work out well. Um, and like, just kind of like a little bit relaxed, but like very serious about what you're doing, obviously, you know, it's like that mixture. And obviously he has to compartmentalize a lot of things too, right? Like he has, (laughs) he's a dad, he has a young, young kid. Um, he has, a job and he's a high level lifter. Like there's a lot of things going on. And so you learn like, okay, when you're doing this, this is what you're focusing on. So I think like, just knowing, like I, in a way, like felt like I was showing up and I was like, all right, I know this is going to work well. Like the situation's going to work well. And I was just like, I just made this promise to myself that I was just going to like be focused on what I wanted to do that day, Mm -hmm. um, type of deal. Um, and obviously we were like, opposites of each other right like we weren't on the same bar like the bar at the same time in terms of warming up um but yeah it's taken a lot of practice for me to get lighter and by that I mean like like you're saying like happy and enjoying myself and bubbly and in the warm-up room and in training in general um I used to be very very serious um and at the end of the day it didn't change the result for me Mm -hmm. I think perhaps if I saw that that had a better result. Like that's how I would have stayed, but it didn't. And so I was like, you know what, if it's not going to allow me <laughs> to lift more, why don't I enjoy this more? Because at the yeah. end of the day, it's why I'm, I'm doing it, especially like right now, right? Like I'm doing it for two things. It's really cool to lift heavy. <laughs> yeah. It's really cool to keep adding kilos onto the barbell. And also I'm enjoying this and I enjoy the people in the sport. Um, yeah. like whether it's, in Malta and enjoying the other, you know, USA members, the other lifters from the other countries, the coaches, you guys are on the media staff. Like I'm enjoying everybody's company or when I'm at training, like I enjoy going to the gym, you know, like for me at this point in my life, it is a huge part of like my social life. (laughs) Um, you know, like I work from home, I take care of two-year-olds, um, while they talk a lot, (laughs) they're not adults. (laughs) So it's like, for me, like that's what powerlifting is right now. Um, it's a huge part of it. And that's how I've seen my best success. So although it's like an active decision, it's something that makes it much more enjoyable and allows me to be successful. Yeah. I mean, you, you were just saying like, if you, if being like super intense and like, I don't, I mean, cause I, I don't want to like, it's kind of a false dichotomy because you are extremely intense like when yeah. you're about to go out on the yeah. platform, like, like there's a switch or, or yes. whatever, you know, versus being more lighthearted in the warm up room and having fun, even like dancing mm-hmm. before you go into the tunnel when in the, yes. but then it's like, you're like slap yourself and like run out, you know, and you're like, you are intense. So it's not like that, but it's yeah. just like the, you have positive energy the whole time. And yeah. I think um, that works for you. Like you've performed it better does. when yeah. you're having more fun. I've, I've just figured out too. And it's just something that it's practice, right? Like competing is a lot of practice, figuring out what's working better. And it doesn't mean that things aren't working well for you. Yeah. Hey, listen, when I was very intense all the time, I was still very successful, but yeah. it was like, what can I improve upon? You know? And some of it had to do with just enjoyment in the sport. And like, yeah. that was very important for me to improve upon, um, for long-term success. And I wanted to continue lifting, um, and not get burnt out type of deal. But yeah. like you're saying, it does it like the switch, the switch flips. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The switch flips for me. And I've just found that like, I work better with such a small window of like that high level of arousal. And it's when I walk out on that platform. And like, you're saying, like when I slap myself in the legs and when I scream, like that's it from here on in, the only thing I'm thinking about is moving the weight on the barbell. But after that, and before that, I'm not thinking about it. Yeah. It's like this very short window, very narrow <laughs> level of attention. Yeah. Um, that works well for me, you know? No, so. it obviously works well. Um, yeah. I mean, like you said, um, it's like, 
you, I love that. Like, this is another like takeaway, really good takeaway point for people, you know, especially young lifters that are listening. It's like, sometimes you're going to make gains from things that aren't just going in and lifting and putting on more muscle and stuff like this. You can make gains by having a better mentality, having, mm -hmm. uh, controlling your arousal better on a comp day, practicing that. Like you talked, um, we, we asked Kelly about that. Like if people watch the full press conference that's on YouTube, um, that, you know, she talked about the, this arousal level thing is something that you can practice. Like you can get 100%. better at having fun on meat day. Yeah. And everyone's different. Some people like yeah. to be super chill, Yeah, even yeah. when they're under the barbell, you know, and other yeah. people like to be intense all the time and it's very individualized, but it is something Definitely. you have to figure out for yourself. Um, and it's only something you can kind of do with experimenting with it and you can do it in yeah. training, you know, and you can do it in meats that are a uh, less pressure <laughs> than the world stage. Yeah. Um, but once you figure it out, then you just can't be nervous to carry it over to the meets that matter. Like yes. I used to have a lot of fun when I competed in meets that weren't as much pressure and I saw great results. And then I would show up to these meets that mean more, right. And put more pressure on myself and get in my own head and be more intense. And it never worked out. Like it never yeah. produced the same results. And that's when I took a step back and like took that bird's eye macro view and was like, I need to change this. This doesn't make sense. Why am I changing my whole process? Just because it's the world stage. <laughs> If I perform while having fun, like let's have fun on the world stage. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, when did you sense that things were not going well for Taylor? Like, did you, did you get, did you ever like look over and just like make eye contact with him and just be like, sorry, bro. I don't know. Like, or, or like, sorry, how, how do you, how do you handle that situation? Because like, I, for me, it was, yeah. it was interesting because it is like, um, I'm very comfortable around the lifters and everything like that, but I felt a little bit uncomfortable there, like, um, with, with Taylor and it was just a different, cause I had, I had, um, been around him in at PA Nats in the first one, um, because, you know, obviously he was at Sheffield this time, but, mm -hmm. um, and he was way more chill having fun, like basically like make, making like a vlog with Duhan. I remember that like really vividly. Um, but this time it was a completely different energy. Um, so yeah, like, did you, did you say anything to him? Did you have a sense that things weren't going great or, or how did you kind of like, did you tell yourself like, don't think about that or, or what? Like, did you tell yourself? Yeah. Anything? It's kind of interesting. Cause obviously I saw him after like he finished spots. Right. Like, and I was yeah. still warming up and I could tell like, he definitely wasn't happy. Right. Yeah. But then bench happened and bench was okay. And then obviously I was already done when, when the, when deadlifts happen, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think after squats, I'm such a mom. I was like at the end of my warm ups, you know, but I, I was like, do you need a drink? Do you need a snack? Like that's going to help them. But at the <laughs> end of the day, like literally, I'm such a mom. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, I also know like when I'm like that, I kind of want like to not know when to ask me questions. Yes. You can offer me a snack. Absolutely. Yeah. But I don't want, you know, like, are you okay? Like if someone asked me that, I would literally want to tackle them, you yeah. know, <laughs> do I look like, okay, bro? Yeah, like, no, I'm not okay. Like yeah. obvious question. Um, yeah. and so like, I respect that, you know, like everyone that competes regardless of the level works so hard for that one day. So when things aren't going your way, it is challenging. And then when you're going to extrapolate that and like, in terms of like Taylor specifically, yeah, like, wow. He's been on top for so long. And then he's had a tough run of it this past year in terms of injuries. And then you have tough calls. Like, so it's like, everything is kind of like building, right. In terms of like, you not having a great day, which yeah. is extremely hard. And then if I'm going to project onto him, which I don't want to project onto him, put words inside of my mouth, <laughs> but as a parent, there's like other factors that play into what you're thinking inside your head, not necessarily on meet day, but just overall, like. Yeah. I know when I don't perform, I'm like, well, like, why am I traveling? <laughs> you know, yeah. you like it's hard. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, you don't want to get into that cycle. So it's like, I like you, I want space to figure out my own shit, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Anyways, I hope I can get him on and I'll talk to him about it and everything. Um, because I do think like the, one of the coolest things that I saw was like, obviously he was, he, I don't think there's any like mystery around the fact that he was not happy. Right. Um, and even angry about, especially sure. the calls. Um, but it was cr so crazy that he was like, if, right after the competition, I believe it was even before awards, which this guy's like got nothing but gold medals. Now he's got to go out mm -hmm. here, stand on the podium in third place. Mm -hmm. Um, and people are coming up to him and taking selfies and he's doing it. Right. Yeah. Like, and people are doing it. I just thought 
what a guy like, like, yeah. um, and to put on that smile, like he's got such yeah. a great smile. Now I know why it's like, you got to have such a great smile like that to like hide what's really happening inside. Yeah. And you're like, Oh yeah. Fuming, absolutely. fuming. Oh yeah. I mean, uh-huh. he, Taylor's an athlete, right? Like at the end yeah. of the day, he's an athlete and yeah. you learn right to like switch back and forth yeah. between what you need to do, but it doesn't mean yeah. whether he's happy or not happy about the day. And I think yeah. the other thing that like, again, people lose sight of is like, he's competing at a top level, right. Uh, in the world and putting up great numbers. And like, he's still not back to his yeah. self after getting hurt. Um, yeah. I mean, again, the turnaround, it was very obvious at Sheffield that he was dealing with some type of injury. And like, that was a quick turnaround. Um, yeah. even if he's feeling better to put strength back on, you know, um, totally. So anyhow, no, I, I saw him uh, later in the night, actually, after coming back from the club with you guys, he, it was like super <laughs> early, super early in the morning, him and his dad were flying out and he was in like way higher spirits and you yeah. know, like definitely going to come back and, um, win, win more world titles. Yeah. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, so I just, I thought, thought that was curious because visually it was right. like a big contrast. Yeah. It's funny. I've never you. really thought about it until you asked, to be honest. <laughs> and I wish I, I, I highly doubt that I took any pictures like of like a wide angle shot of like the warm up room, but like it would, I can just in my head, like I have this image burned in that he's like sitting in the corner, like intense and his dad's talking. And then you're over here just like dancing and like Brian's just like, have, happy like, go lucky. Get this chick out happy here. go lucky. Yeah. <laughs> um, what yeah. were you listening to throughout the comp? Oh, all different all different okay. music okay. on squats. I like to go with a more mellow vibe, if you will, uh-huh. um, to, you know, relax a little. Yeah. Um, so this is going to sound ridiculous and this is not always what I listen to squatting. I swear to God, but I did when I was in Australia and I was like, you know what, let's run it back. Uh, I listened to the frozen soundtrack. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy how if you listen to something enough times, it like grows on you and you start to like it, even though like maybe it obviously doesn't seem to go with powerlifting. No, not at all. Um, and then what? you know when I bench, I'll listen to. I was listening to like you know like two thousands party music, and then deadlifts. I usually will listen to like DMX or something like that a little bit more. All right, awesome. Yeah, I'm I mean, hitting, you're, if you will. You're in the zone. You were dancing and stuff. At some point, I'll post some videos of you, of your my dad dance moves. moves. Um, yeah, I mean, like you're. I have not to great. say have to say, um, at the club, you are a way better dancer than you are in the warm up room. Way better. <laughs> like, well, I was trying to describe. Oh, wow. Okay. But I was trying to describe my, my moves, my dance moves in the warm up room are like dependent upon the lift. Right. Okay. So like bench, I'm like trying to think about like, okay, I'm like, get my shoulder blades back. So like, I'm like shrinking back. Right. Like, yeah, and yeah. then for deadlift, I'm like trying to get long. So I'm like walking around, like wiggling my shoulders, trying to get my yeah. arms long. So the dance moves make no sense. Yeah, exactly. It's a lot of shoulder. <laughs> it's a lot of shoulders. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty funny yeah. in the warm up room, but then, so I was like, man, Meg really is like not very good at dancing, but then, whoa, later on. <laughs> totally proved totally proved everyone wrong on the dance oh floor. that's hilarious that's so funny not a great dancer should probably stop doing that yeah no, <laughs> I'm, no you just keep being you that's what's that's what works um how was the crowd from most accounts it was the most packed and the loudest session um mm-hmm. did you what, what what did you think about the crowd i thought it was great i think in all of the worlds that i've been to like it was a cool setup because you felt the crowd like because they had the bleacher setup you know Um, so you definitely felt the crowd and people were loud too, um, which I personally like, um, the, I feel like the worlds that I've gone to, it's kind of like increased a little bit over time. Like Sweden was dead silent. You could hear a pin drop very kind of like weightlifting ask, if you will, an environment, South Africa got a, like a little bit more rowdy. I feel like because of how it was set up, you were a lot closer to the platform as a fan. Uh Um, and then how this one was set up with the bleachers, it really pushed people like closer, you know, in a lot of ways. And like, that's cool. I like that. I like the noise. Um, I like lifting in front of a crowd. Yeah, it was amazing. Like they actually had to bring in like more seats and stuff like because it was standing room only. I think during your session from from what I've heard, because obviously I was like, I didn't really go out there too much, but um, that it was the most packed, the loudest that it ever got. I mean, I think there was a couple other sessions that were pretty loud, like the 93s and like um, the day after you competed was the break the day mm-hmm. off. And then the day after that, I think was pretty packed as well. That was like when most people were still around right. in town and whatever, but yeah, it was, it was awesome. So beyond your performance, like what else did you think about the competition in Malta? 
like just the world championships as a whole, like the whole experience? I think it was really well done. Um, you know, I think that it's hard to plan big events, especially when people are flying in from all around the world. And yeah. like, it, I think that each kind of world championship that I've gone to, it's kind of like improved in the atmosphere and in the setup and the warm up room and like everything like that. I think obviously beforehand there was the whole training fiasco, if you will. But even that, like the they all got sorted, event right? director, like was like, oh, all right, like we're gonna fix it. And he fixed yeah. it before it started and it was sorted out and it was a piece of cake. Yeah, um, they just, Aleko just brought in. So like they were going to have two warm up racks. First, they were only going to have one. Then they were like, oh, we'll have two. Then they just threw a third one in there. And it was, yeah. it was totally fine. It was like, people were yeah. freaking out about nothing. Right. In the end, in the end, I mean, obviously yeah, it's worrisome going in. Very worrisome, especially when you're like, well, are there any places to train in the area? And it's like, oh. um, yeah. but I think the important thing is like, it was feedback right from the lifters and they listened like the yeah. the event director listened fix it not a problem right moro and moro was he did a great job so awesome he yeah, yeah he did a really great job um the warm-up room was beautiful the yeah. setup like the backstage area and the walkout was fantastic you know yeah. Yeah. um the platform was cool like the, yeah. how you were actually performing and how, like how they had the audience set up. Like it was a very, very cool experience. Um, and yeah. I do think that each one I've gone to has gotten better in experience, if you will. The hotel was amazing. Like yeah. the, the location, like being able to like walk around outside and have like 30 restaurants, like at your fingertips, like oh yeah, all, it was open, beautiful. All, open all night, like maybe a five minute walk to the beach. Like, yeah, it was, it was, crazy. It was very like, easy. Like, although you had to travel to get there once you were there, it was very easy easy That's, from the airport to get there. You had yeah. everything you needed at your fingertips. It was in the hotel. The hotel was nice. Like, yeah. What more can you ask for? Honest. And, and then exactly. like just the whole, like, um, getting the credentials and just every little mm -hmm. thing that Moro did, I thought it was just like awesome. Like, yeah, it was very um, well done. And, and shout, shout out Emmanuel Schreiber from the, uh, the general manager of the IPF, who was like a big, who plays a big role in finding these venues and these meet directors and stuff like that. He did, he, he got a good one here. Yeah. And I've just heard that they're going to do junior worlds there next year. Oh, really? That's um, cool. So, and, and just from, you know, my behind the scenes talks and stuff, like they did such a good job. There'll probably be a world championships in Malta every year going forward. Like it'll yeah. rotate around to all the different ones. Mm -hmm. So maybe in four or five years, we'll be, we'll run it back in Malta again. Hey, let's run it back. Um, what did you think? There's a couple other storylines people are talking about a lot of like, you know, controversial stuff. Like, so what did you think about like the jury and the officiating stuff? And I don't know if you watched any of the sessions like before or after yours or it, since you got home, watch on the live stream or anything like that. What was your take on, on like the officiating and jury stuff? Well, they ruined my perfect day, Paul. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I had... I could have gone nine for nine, but they made me go eight for nine. Um, okay. Yeah. So honestly, if I remove myself from it and I take it as a fan, it made it really confusing to watch, um, yeah. in terms of the overturned lifts and the amount of overturned lifts, um, personally as an athlete. And I think like, as a fan, I prefer when it is the jury gets involved. If the lift is contested by somebody else. Um, I think it's more similar to like other sports in a lot of sense in that way. Um, and I think as an athlete too, like it was weird. It was a weird vibe because you got two whites and you're like, eh, you're like looking around after you're like, wait, good, not, bad, yeah. good, bad. And then you're, yes, you're looking around, you're kind of waiting. And if it's not your third attempt, you're also like in between attempts and specifically for this meet, like the, it was very quick. Yeah. <laughs> so like, um, the turnaround between lifts was probably like six minutes or so. It wasn't very long. Um, so it's kind of like a lot to say process within the turnaround in time of events. Um, I am personally not a fan of the setup, but um, who knows if it will stick or not. I know that someone, didn't they talk about not having to just move to this and not doing contested lifts and like the yeah, general there's, assembly? They were, well, I don't know if it was in the general assembly because I, yeah. I, left, I left the general assembly after a while, but um, it was... I know coming into this, there was talk of that they were going to make it so that you couldn't protest other, like, like team USA sure. could not protest another team's yeah. lift. Um, but you could still protest in favor of your own lifters. Mm. So I think they're going to keep that aspect of like, you can protest. Yeah. I just don't, I guess like, I don't understand right now how it was set up for worlds 
it yeah. doesn't even matter because the jury's reviewing it anyways. So it's like almost yeah. pointless <laughs> to yeah. take the walk, you know? And, and in uh, this case, it was a long walk to get over there. It was there. a long walk. Yeah. I saw Mike Z running over there a bunch oh of times. He, he got, got his, his steps, steps in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But um, in, in some ways too, it like, it kind of takes away some of the strategy because I remember Mike Z telling me before South Africa last year that he has a really good record going to juries and protesting and saying the yeah. right thing sure. that's going to get them to listen. Um, yeah. Whereas you'll see a lot of times if someone comes out, they're just like, don't even come over here. Um, so I, I don't know. It I takes away too, some of the strategy a little bit. It takes away a little of the gamesmanship of, of, of like knowing how to play, how to deal the with game. the jury. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. And I think too, like that's a part of the game and it takes it like you're saying, like takes away yeah. a part of the game. Um, but I'll take it one step farther. I think it takes away like having the jury almost like immediately connected. They're basically more refs. Like it's taking away some of the, like, uh, like it almost like, what's the right word here? Um, negating like what the refs are calling. Right. Like, yeah, it's making the refs kind of irrelevant in some ways. Right? Yeah. It's making them irrelevant. It's like, why even have platform refs? Let's just send it right to the screen, you know, like have them review it. Um, cause it is making them irrelevant. And then I would go one step farther. Not only do I want to not have it sent right to the jury, if there's two V one, either way, I would like it just to be, you can test lists and you know what you only have one, like you get two contested lists, one for your lifter and one against another country, because yeah. then people are contesting, like taking it very seriously almost mm -hmm, like football. Mm -hmm. Like you have so many challenge flags, exactly. use it wisely. Cause then it's going to be used wisely. And then it, it really even the, the field, yeah. you know, I don't know. And, and there has to be some kind of thing around, like, if they do it, then can I change my next attempt? Like if I already put right. in my attempt and then you guys overturn it, like 30 seconds after the 60 second clock is up. Right. Like, the, but I already right. put my other attempt in, then it just creates this cluster of a situation. I feel yeah. like in the NFL, for instance, it's like you throw the challenge flag. It's like the game stops. Everything yeah. stops. Yeah. And it's like, we're going to sort this out and it adds in a couple extra right. minutes of time into the game. Everyone can catch their breath, yeah. whatever. So, I mean, there's even strategy like in basketball, like taking timeouts certain times, like to give your team a rest, like maybe you throw a challenge just to get a rest. If you have, if the, the pace is super fast, something like this, I don't know. It'd be interesting to make it more part of the game as opposed to just put it all in the jury's hands. Um, you know, and then if we are going to do it, like, I want to, let's talk about the angles that they have and like, can they do slow motion? I mean, it's just, when you start looking at stuff that closely, it's, I don't know. I don't, I personally just, I don't really like it, but that's just my, yeah, I don't either. And I think if you look at 90% of things too closely, you could find something wrong with a lot of, <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of things. Um, and at the end of the day, like people want to see lifts made. Yes. Exactly. I want them to be the standard, but when yeah. you're maxing out like a deadlift, like there's going to be a grind. It's not going to yeah. be pretty, you know, like yeah. when you're maxing out a squat, like it's not going to be pretty, like that's not necessarily what it's about. It should be the standard, but like, it doesn't need to be perfect. Exactly. We got to make makes. grinders. Okay. Again, like, like Kimberly Walford had her, her third deadlift overturn. And I watched the replay several times. I mean, it's a grinder. She's like shaking around a little bit, but I don't really think the bar ever goes up and down or anything. And it's just like, yeah. so, so now it just, yeah, you're right. Now it's going to lower totals because everything has to be perfect, clean uh, across the board. And I don't know. I just think it's more entertaining when you see someone giving that effort to like, like who, who doesn't want to see Kimberly Walford and like Jess Bittner, like go for these crazy grind deadlifts. Like, yeah. Kinda. Right. And I think it's hard too, because if you're looking at worlds for instance right they overturned yeah. a lot of lifts so then you're thinking there's a couple lifts in there and you're like why didn't that get overturned exactly so then it you yeah, know it's like this slippery slope and all of the burden is now on the officials and none the of it jury. is on well in the jury but like refs yeah. and the jury and none of it is on contesting lifts like none of it is about you know yeah. so it's like i don't know it definitely changes a lot of things um and it makes it interesting but i can't say i'm necessarily like a huge fan yeah. Yeah. I mean, you gotta be more undeniable yeah. now than ever. Um, obviously there were a couple of people on our squad, uh, Kaiko and Jessica Espinal both had 27 white lines. Yeah. It's amazing. Right. Amazing. Um, right. so it's possible, but, um, another topic that people have talked a lot about, um, since the competition is just the pace of the competition. Mm -hmm. And like before I meant to mention, like we were talking about Taylor and like mindset stuff, 
you don't have time to really think about anything. No, like it was so <laughs> fast. It was really fast, but I like that personally. Like it doesn't bug me. Um, and I, when I knew that it was going to be eight lifters in a flight, like it's kind of how I, I trained. Now that being said, I am a lighter female. Yeah. I'm not lifting a thousand pounds. <laughs> yeah. I have the capability to do that. I think if, you know, the lighter, the midweight classes can do that. I think for the heavier weight classes, it's kind of impossible, um, yeah. to do that. And I think that makes it really tough. Um, so I think it probably depends on who you're talking to, right? Like if they, Absolutely. If, how they feel about it. And I totally understand and respect, like, I think it's almost impossible for the heavier weight and the super, super heavies to, to go at that pace and lift the amount of weight they are capable of. Yeah. And so that's kind of the question is like, is it worth the trade-off of like having super heavies who in many cases we say like people will show up just to see them like move mm -hmm. like these massive weights. Like it's one of the coolest things about our sport is when you see someone like Jesus, like squatting a thousand pounds, like it's yep. just, it's, it's insane. Um, and then, or does it, so like from an entertainment standpoint, like, like me personally, I'd rather watch someone squat a thousand pounds and, mm -hmm. and I don't care if the, the comp, if I got to watch an extra hour of powerlifting or whatever, but obviously I'm a fan of the sport, but the trade-off is like, you know, there's talking about Euro sport, squeezing it all in so that these millions of people can view it. I don't know. What do you think about that trade-off? Um, I think that millions of people would like to view a thousand pounds squat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I think it's different though. Like, I think like, like kind of, you know, if it is a lighter weight class, they probably want it faster, right? Like we're not squatting a yeah. thousand pounds. <laughs> yeah. So like they want to see the action, but like, yeah, if you're watching, Hey Zeus, you want to see him squat as much as he can humanly squat. Like that's why yeah. you're watching. Um, cause that is that it's something special and you don't get to see that all the time. Um, so I don't know anything about TV <laughs> and I don't know how you build that in, but like, I do think that that's important. And like, that's something that is like, makes it more about the lifter. Um, like, I think there could, there can be a happy medium, you know, about yeah. like expanding the sport and bringing the viewership up and viewership, viewership up while yeah. also like keeping the athlete at the center so that Jesus yeah. can squat an absurd amount of weight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's an interesting trade-off because, um, you know, I, I even don't even like to think about it as like pro athlete or not, because it's like the, the whole point of getting them on, I mean, it's like it's for the athlete. Yeah. Right. Like, 100%. like it, to get them on TV is yeah. like, we're going to get Jesus like 2 million views in yeah. on like household TV to an audience that we yeah. never get to. So it's like, I, it's all for it's the like lifter, but it's the just lack like, of communication between like, yeah. what, what are the needs for yeah. certain lifters to be able to yeah, lift exactly. a thousand pounds? I mean, I mean like they, let's be honest. A lot of people don't know what it's like to lift a thousand pounds. I surely don't. But if I did, I would definitely need at least 12 minutes to recover. <laughs> and that's exactly what he said. That's exactly what he said in his post compressor. I mean, yeah. he, he's an absolute, like, yeah. he's, he's such a gem of a person, like, and he's such a, like a, an athlete, like he's going to yeah. say the athlete, oh, yeah, of course. which is just like, I don't care. I'm going to do whatever it takes yeah. to win. And I don't, you know, I don't care, but he said, but if we had 12 person flights, like we did at Sheffield, I feel like right. that was perfect. Right. Okay. Well, and so maybe there's a way, like maybe it. there's a way if yeah. there's somehow like, then we make a 12 person flight, but you're only showing one flight. Like, listen, I don't know. I'm yeah. not a TV person, but it's almost like yeah. you got to match the TV with the, the sport. I don't know. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like people have been talking about, maybe they do, uh, like what's the maximum you can have like 14 in a flight or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. IPF. So maybe they do like seven and seven, seven women, seven men in the same flight, same flight. Yeah. Or something like that. Right. Um, right. Right. And just run it one flight and that's right. it. And not, two, right. not two flights of eight. Um, yeah, we'll see what they do. I mean, I think it would be smart. Like you're saying maybe in the early part of the week, eight and eight, but then maybe by the end of the week, it's 10 and 10, 12 and 12. I don't know. It's probably people who hate that response, but I just think like, yeah. <laughs> but I do think like as a lighter weight class person, like you can train to lift well, that's, with that recovery. I mean, this is putting mm -hmm. everyone on notice now. Like everyone has to train <laughs> like this now. Like they might do it again. Sure. They might not yes. listen and they might yeah, eat of course. So you got to be ready. Um, yeah. I think it plays in your advantage, especially given your background with like, you've done a lot of cardio in your life. Sure. Yeah. And I don't, I honestly, I, I don't like waiting around. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, okay, oh, let's go. I was even trying to go early on the, on the, the, these flights. They could be like, <laughs> nope, it's not your turn yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, the other thing yeah. people are talking about a lot is just like the media presence that that was in Malta, mm -hmm. like just like all the things like in, in, in what did you what was your take on that overall? Did you feel like like because obviously we did a lot with Power Team America. Do we do too much? Were you feeling like like we were like pressuring you to do too many things that you didn't really want to do? No, I mean, like, what else, what else do I have to do while I'm in Malta? You know, yeah. like, yeah. I think it's a great thing. And like, again, as someone that's in the sport, like I'm in the sport for myself, but I also see like, Hey, like this is a bigger picture. Like I want the sport to grow over time. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the way you allow the sport to grow over time and get people interested and excited about the sport is like, let them in, like let them in on some of the behind the scenes. Even if you're thinking about it as like, if a new lifter is watching some of these things, like they're like, Oh, that's really cool. Like that's what's happening behind the scenes. And maybe either a couple of things, it makes them more comfortable to go to a competition or maybe yeah. it sets them up for like having some big goals of like, that's what I want to do. I want to get to worlds and compete at the world level. Yeah. And they see themselves like in someone else's shoes, you know? Definitely. I mean, I, I that's one thing we definitely wanted to show was like a little bit of like what it's like to be here. Um, mm -hmm. because like, I think a lot of times in the past, like I'm, I'm a huge fan of the sport. I've been watching it for years all you see is a live stream. And then right. uh, you, if you're, if you're, then you follow all the lifters on social media and you try to watch, like, do they post anything cool? Like any uh, extras, but you don't really have time. Like you don't have time to be doing like selfie videos and stuff like this, like during the competition itself. Right. right. So you end up walking away with just like me the memories of it all, but like no one really got it on camera or anything like that. Um, just overall though, like it wasn't just us, like it was like white lights yeah. media, Eurosport. Um, SBD had a massive crew, um, IPF had a, its own like interview yeah. stage and stuff. Like, what do you just think about overall? Like, I mean, it, was that a big difference from South Africa? Um, yes. I think the setup of it, if that makes sense, like the actual like media setup and like having like different interviews in the stations, I think at big meets there's typically a lot of cameras kind of like in the warm up yeah. area. So like there were more, but it's not necessarily a change if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, so like, it wasn't something that was, um, uh, like unusual alarming. yeah, or alarming, um, as we're warming up, it was just like, oh, there's more people back here. Cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, but I think in terms of like the setup of there were actual like media rooms and setups for interviews and things like that, like that was a big difference. Yeah. Um, and I think that's cool. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, I yeah. want to just keep pushing that stuff. I'm happy to hear that, um, from you as well, because I know like, uh, I think your interview that we, the, your pre competition press conference, like, I think you, when just, I didn't like, tell you anything that one. You, yeah. And you just landed, right? Like, I think you just had like, I think you hadn't slept or something. Uh, oh but, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah I was, yeah. I felt, I felt, and then also like the Taylor one too, um, like he had just landed and he like, didn't, he, he like, didn't read the schedule or whatever. There was some miscommunication. He didn't realize that he was going to be doing a press conference Yeah. when he did. He just happened to like walk around and I just like yep. roped him. Uh, and I was like, Oh, you're here for your press conference. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to make sure that it was like well received and that, um, it wasn't too much. I know that at Sheffield, they, some of the athletes, you know, talked about like doing a lot of press the day before. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's why we try to do everything two days out, stuff like this. But, um, yeah, I think it's like, uh, you know, it's hard. Cause as a lifter, obviously like you're so focused on what you're doing, but it's also uh, like, take the step back sometimes. And like, it's good for the sport. <laughs> Yeah. And like, yeah, I'm, I'm there to do my best job, but like, it's, there's also some things that are like, they're very good for the sport. And like, it's something that's very good for the sport. I mean, look at other sports, right? Like the UFC, for instance, yeah. <laughs> um, people love to see that it helps grow. Like people get invested in the lip, the lifters, the fighters, as well as the sport. Right. Exactly. So anyways. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, all right. Another question. You made a spicy post about oh. travel. Um, I did. And, well, kind of like you, you kind of chimed in on one of Solana. Oh yeah. 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 About, okay, like, travel, travel about. super yeah. overrated and this, sure. and, that. and there's been a lot of talk about this, um, like, you know, from some camps. Um, so you've been to three world championships, um, yes. we've traveled for all of them. You've also went to yep. Australia. Um, which one was the toughest to travel? And then just like, do you have any, you know, obviously South Africa, there's like some horror stories about, but how do you mitigate the effect of travel? And do you think again, like with the pace thing, like you're kind of a unique, like, like when I get off of a flight, uh, like from Malta and I'm six one and like, these flights are not made for like six, one, like 200 pound people. Um, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Like I definitely like don't feel my best. So how do you mitigate the effects of travel as well? 
Yeah. So I agree. I think it gets overhyped so much. Yeah. I really do. I mean, for one thing, like I understand there's bigger time zone differences when I'm flying to Europe or flying to Australia or South Africa. Okay. Let's say South Africa and Australia out. Cause they're very long flights, but like when I'm yeah. flying to Europe, right. Yeah. Malta or Sweden, there's more of a time zone difference, but like it's a say six and a half to eight and a half hour flight. When I go to Austin, I'm flying for six hours. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, you know, it's a whole meet, but it's not a whole meet, you know, like it's on the other side of the country. I think uh, in some ways, like probably in the U S it's a bit different where depending on where you live, you might have to fly pretty often to compete, yeah. um, and fly a considerable amount of time, like not necessarily like an hour flight. You might be flying for five or six hours. Um, yeah, it's a different time zone change scenario, but when you are traveling for these meets, like the reason you are traveling is to compete. Um, yeah. so depending on when I compete, I may or may not even have to adjust like my sleep schedule. Um, for me, um, like in South Africa and in where the heck were we just Malta, yeah. um, since I competed at night, it was like midday here. So I was like, Hey, I like, I'm not even going to try to adapt too much. I'm just going to let myself stay up a bit later and sleep in. It doesn't yeah. matter as much. Um, but I think that more than just the time zone change, I think a lot of people screw it up even before that, like you're saying, like on the travel and just don't take into consideration, like how much that takes out of you. And what I mean by that is like, you need to stay hydrated. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like simple things, like you need to figure out your nutrition, especially if your travel is going to take over five hours, you know, like you need yeah. to know these things and have a plan before you get on the plane, especially if you're going international, because you don't know what different airports are going to be like, you don't know what food's going to be available. Um, and if you kind of like check off those factors, you're already ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, if I am traveling internationally, like I definitely try to line up my flights too. So wherever my longest flight is, like it's in my nighttime usually, you know what I mean? So I do mm -hmm. sleep. Um, and then I do not sleep when I get to where I'm going. Um, that's a key, that's a key, that pro, a key pro tip right there. Like I've traveled, my, my wife is from India. I've gone to India like a million times and Don't that do is it. the key. You got to push through that first day. You do. And then you go have to, to bed push at, the first at night. Yeah. Yep. Like, otherwise the time zones, you'll be totally off. It'll be so off. And I've also found that when I get to wherever I'm going, like it helps to move, Yeah, you know, um, like to get in light activity, take, take walks and stuff. Yeah. Take walks, some light movement, like light, light session, if you need to, whatever, but like, don't just be sedentary and go lay in bed. Like that's not going to help you. 100%. Um, so being proactive in terms of the travel and being proactive once you get there is huge in terms of how you're going to feel two days down the line. Um, I found personally, like when I fly in like three days out, it's usually kind of like a sweet spot for me, um, in terms of feeling good by the time meet day comes. And also just, you know, like I'm a homebody, like I like being home. So like, I like having my last heavy training day at home. Like that's something I enjoy. Um, and then flying out after. So it's kind of like a sweet spot for me and I found it works really well. Um, but yeah, I mean, South Africa and Australia were obviously the hardest travels because they were both over 24 hours. Yeah. That's a lot. So, so did you add in another day like for South Africa or still three days out or something or what? So I was supposed to get to South Africa on Sunday night. Um, we ended up getting there to the actual venue Monday at like 3 a.m. Yeah. And I competed on Wednesday. So I mean I had I technically slept three times, let's put it that way. Okay. Gotcha. Um so that was one was two days. Like if you could do that one over, would you have gone a day earlier? No. Um, I mean the, the sleeping three times is really <laughs> the key part That's for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I felt fine by the time I got to the meet. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily do it differently, you know? Um, but I, you know, and I think that it's, it's also, it's the balance for where I am right now too, like in life, like I don't want to be away from the girls for more than a week. So it's like balancing how to best fit travel around that too. Yeah. That makes sense. So. All right. Um, let's talk about a couple of specific things with lifting, lifting related. Um, like, so for instance, you put 15 kilos on your squat between yeah. South Africa and Malta. Sure um, did. How, first of all, like, how was it even possible? Like what, what did you do? What's, what's, um, ever, we talk about your bench, like ad nauseum, but, um, yeah. what's going on with your squat? Like you're like, your yeah. squat's blowing up. Like I said, you would have taken the silver medal. what did I say? Silver medal in, in the 69s on squat. Yeah. So it's funny. I made a couple of posts after worlds last year that like aged beautifully. Really? You don't know what that's going to happen, but I made one about squats and for my squats. 
since um, having children, it was just like, I always felt like something was off, something was off, something was off, but they were still improving, right? Mm -hmm. um, like they were still getting better. I was still gaining strength back, but just like top end was a little bit unpredictable and like it made it hard, obviously to call numbers when your top end's a little unpredictable. Yeah. Um, and obviously it makes it frustrating too. Cause you just feel like, eh, like something's a little bit lacking. Um, and I was pretty convinced the whole time that it was just like my core strength and it made my bracing a bit inefficient. Um, and at the end of the day, it basically was what it was, but we've specifically like worked on like increasing my core strength and my bracing, um, for my squats after worlds last year. And like, I think it's paid dividends, you know? Um, yeah. so, um, that's really cool. And like my top end of squat is incredibly predictable now. Um, nice. and also like very on like in training and in competition. Like I, like I didn't miss squats in training. Like even before I used to miss squats in training, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so between that and also getting much better of like just RP, you could say RP, but I think it, for me, it was accepting where I was at, at the time. Yeah. Like, I think in my head, I wanted to be further along because that's where I was before having kids, but I just wasn't there yet. So I would push things a little too much and burn a little too close to the fire for too long. Yeah. Where now it's like, I have a better understanding of like, all right, let's take a step back. And I think after worlds last year, I felt I had the time mm -hmm. to do that. So that was like the gift of time that allowed me to do that and work on small things to improve some of my bracing. And I think the combination has allowed my spot to kind of take off. Um, and I think what's really cool is the two meets where like December meet where I did 190 and then worlds where I did 195, where I went into the meets and felt healthy. Uh, my third squat was like, Oh, probably could have added another five, you yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, it looked um, like there's room in the tank, you know, still there. So. Yeah. So it's kind of cool to have that data too, you know, cause yeah. those are basically the first two meets since working for like reworking my squat and feeling good going into meet day where it's like, Oh, all right, this is really cool data to have in terms of my confidence in approaching the platform. Yeah. Um, too. So that's, I mean, again, it comes back a little bit to the mindset of like not push and then also coaching because mm -hmm like having Kelly there to kind of like rein you in someone that you listen to. Yep. And then also just being like a little bit more patient. Like you said, yep. like, like you had twins, your bracing is sure. going to be off. Um, so like, don't, don't, don't miss lifts and training. Like, right. like don't push too hard. Like don't fight, don't fight. It's too really easy to, to say, you know, it, it's, really it's easy so to easy say. to say. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing that, and what works really well, like between Kelly and I is at the time, obviously it was a lot newer to the coaching relationship, but she would obviously tell me these things, but also not push it too hard, you know, yeah. like, and like, it is much more powerful if you learn and come to the conclusion yourself, you can be guided there. And like, yes. as a coach, I think that's a really important thing. Like your job is to guide people. Right. Yes. And if you allow them to come to the conclusion and learn the lesson themselves, but you're guiding them in the right direction, like that's so much more powerful. And yeah. for me, it was very powerful. And worlds was kind of like that cherry on the top where it was like, okay, like this is there, but we got to figure it out. And I got to take some steps back to yes. do that. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, like it's cool. And I'm excited to spot 200 plus let's be honest. I can't the wait. other post that I made that age well was my deadlift post. I was like 205. I missed 205 last year at worlds. And I said, I was going to make it my second attempt this year. And I did. Boom. You did 205. And now you're up to 210. Yeah. That was my next thing. Like I mean, a savant. You put 10, <laughs> 10 kilos. I mean, we're talking crazy numbers here. I mean, between your, between your squat and your deadlift, you add in 25 kilos right there. So your total right. from, from, from South Africa, which I mean, you did, you, you did pretty well on squat and deadlift there. I mean, it was your bench. 100%. That you, that yeah. You oh yeah. You of, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, so, um, was there, and is it, was it the same thing with deadlift? Is it the bracing thing as well or what else? Um, I, I think honestly, it's just been technical improvements to my deadlifts. I think that they were getting there heading into South Africa, but they, my deadlifts technically have continued to improve. And yeah, of course that helps the top end when your technique is better, but what it's really helped for me is being able to handle more volume, um, and be able to recover from it. Um, and when you can handle more volume and recover from it, it does help personally, my top end to go up. So I've just been able to put in more work for deadlifts and since I've been able to do that, my top end has kind of like consistently increased. Yeah. That's so. awesome. 
That's, yeah. that's so cool. I mean, so like looking forward, uh, let's make a post now that's going to age well. Um, <laughs> what, <laughs> what are you, what are we talking about? So let's see, you finish with 195 on squat. What do you think like at the world championships next year, what's possible? In a whole year, what I throw on, what I throw on, oh God, I threw a lot on last year. 15. I threw 15, 15 on last year. 15. You All want right. another 15? I would, one nine. Yeah, I'll take another 15. What did I do? 195? Um, last year, 10. Yeah, yeah I'll take another 15. Realistically, though, I definitely think like 10 is realistic for sure, but I'll take 15. Okay, let's do it. And then uh, what about deadlift? Listen. So you did 10. You I did have 10 on my piece of paper right here. Yeah. I crossed out all the other numbers, but I'll let you see them. Maybe can, 220. Uh, it was 210 before. Oh, yeah. I can't even read it. Oh, but yeah. Here's my I, little. Okay. I think and I, I crossed saw, it out. You, you, I think you posted this. I did, but I didn't yeah. show my other, my other guys up here, but that's yeah. fine. Uh, my, de my deadlift, I had 210 on here. Obviously I deadlifted 210. So now I have 220 and I had so many people message me and they're like, why wouldn't you write 225? But I'm like, <laughs> come on, let me get to 220 first. Uh, <laughs> That's amazing. But, I mean, you know, I think what's crazy is I, it used to be such a huge struggle for me to deadlift. I never thought I was even going to deadlift 190. Um, I, I couldn't get over like 187 for the life of me. And now we're talking, um, 220, right? So I think realistically, I think realistically by next year, I'll be able to deadlift 220. So just on those two numbers that we yeah. just, you know, squat and deadlift, yeah, that would bring your total to 557.5, um, which is the current and world the record, which is well on my new bench, it would be 552. So, well, I'm just saying, like, if we add, if we take your 532 and we and add 20. Oh, I gave myself you said 15. 25. You, oh, you said, you said, fit, yes, you said, so, okay. so, so we're let's adding, play the so, conservative game. Let's play the conservative game. Well, I'm just saying like, no, we yeah. already put it in the universe and <laughs> you already, you already basically okay, fair, have, fair, have fair. like yeah. put it in the universe that my total is like, already 557.5. 557.5. So everyone should be on notice. Yeah. And then on like, we haven't even talked about bench. Yeah. Like, so we know your bench is also going to go up a lot. We don't have to get a specific number. Let's let the Let's not go get carried away. <laughs> we Let's not get done. carried away. But I will say I'm very excited about bench. I feel like I needed to get worlds under my belt to have a little bit more confidence and direction that I was doing the right thing, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And I learned that I was definitely on the right track. And we've made a couple of little tweaks since then. Like I started wearing a belt on bench um, mm -hmm. that have made it even better. So I feel like now that I'm confident that I'm doing the right thing, that it's just about consistency and getting reps. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, like I just started training this week, obviously, but I was doing bench before and what did I bench at worlds? 127 and a half. Uh, yep. yeah. Um, like 120, I feel like 125 right now is like a regular number. So like okay. we're looking, I want to get back to my old bench numbers. I'm going to be honest. I'm just going to okay. throw it out there. That's so really like what I'm looking for. So, um, looking at your old bench numbers, what are we talking? We're talking 142 and a half. 142. So let's just, let's just say 145. Not right? that I have that branded in my brain or anything. Yeah, That's what I have on this piece of paper. Cause I did this before the bench rule change. You can't see this again. One, 145. 145. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. And I never changed it because the bench rule changed. And I was like, you know what? I'm not changing it. It might take a long time to get back there, but we're going to figure it out. So that's another 15 kilos that you just, so we're talking like. That's more um, than 15. Yeah, it's more than 15. So <laughs> we're talking like a 570 total ish. Five, you're going right, to be in the I don't want to be greedy. I don't want to be greedy. I'll exactly. just say 560 something. It's Let's fine. just say 560 on the dot, 561 maybe. Um, I had a dream actually that I totaled. I. <laughs> And that I totaled in the five sixties. I can't tell you what, I didn't have specifics, but I literally dreamt it. And I, I, I texted Kelly. I was like, guess what? In my dream, I just totaled five sixty. She's like, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but I, awesome. I, all joking aside, like I am very optimistic about my total growing in the next year. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. I mean, you, you talked about it in the press conference. Um, like I said, I just posted the, the real, um, where you talked about what you have left in the tank. If people go watch the full version on the YouTube, like Kelly weighs in on this, like what she thinks, like you, where you have the most room in the tank on. And basically you're going to improve on all three. And like, I mean, I've been singing, I've been singing your praises to anyone that will listen that, you know, your total is just going to keep going up. Like you're like a junior. It's crazy. Like your total is growing. Like a junior's total is growing. 
Because um, in my mind, I'm still 23. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, okay, last little topic here um, is about Sheffield again. Do you yeah. want to go to Sheffield? You hit the 95% uh, of the world record total. And I think we've made a good case so far on here. Like, do you, is that the Lesson. biggest thing? Yeah, go ahead. hundred percent. Okay. So I said, I've said twice in my powerlifting career, if X happened, I would cry. The first was if I hit a 500 total, then ironically I hit 495 and I cried. <laughs> and I was like, if I get invited to Sheffield, I'll cry. Here's the thing. It's just like a party. Let's be honest. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. and I'm here for that. Like I'm here to have a good time. And when I see that platform, I'm like, it's meant for a good time. You know yes. what I mean? Like it's a stage to perform on, if you will, literally, quite literally. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so that's exciting for you. Oh yeah. And for everyone, obviously, but um, for everybody. And, yeah. And then I can only um, imagine the after party. <laughs> yeah. Right. My favorite, yeah. Right. My favorite meet ever to, that I've done to this day in terms of like experience of like the stage in the crowd was the, um, the Grand Prix at the Arnold. Uh -huh. That's what it's called, right? That's yeah. whatever it's called on the, on the rogue stage, like inside of the Arnold pre COVID yeah, now yeah. Sheffield is like this on steroids. Yes, absolutely. Except not, on, except, except not, except not on steroids, but yes, exactly. So, okay. I think I have a silver bullet argument for, for why you should be, uh, getting a wild card to go to Sheffield. So I don't know if you listen I'm to a other... wild card. Hey, there you go. <laughs> the definition, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> You know, they talk a lot like on other podcasts, King of the Lifts, um, about like the 59s and the 66s, like talking about yep. Watscar, talking about yeah, yeah, Hannah. Yeah. And yeah. there weren't any 59s and there weren't any 66s there last year. Yep. And basically making this case of like what it would mean to these weight classes to be represented at Sheffield. And that's great. Like, think about it, like how many 59s and 66 kilo lifters out there that that would be like a, such a big inspiration yes, that would be such I a agree. Big, yeah it's a good argument right it's a good argument yeah, well if you like it's a good argument if you like that argument <laughs> yeah think about how many moms there are out there yep and what it would mean to moms everywhere to have a mom on the Sheffield stage mm -hmm. i mean there are literally billions of moms there's mm -hmm. not billions of 59s and 66s so if you like that argument Mm -hmm. This is taking it to the next level. It's like exponentially more inspiring and would inspire, you know, what it would mean to so many more people out there um, to have a mom at Sheffield, which I don't believe they've, they've had before. So I, I think that's your, I think that's your silver bullet case. Yeah. I'm here for that. I'm here for that platform. I think, you know, someone, someone said to me at one point in time, like, I don't want to make like your whole thing, like about being a mom and lifting. I'm like, but that is my whole thing. Yeah. You know, like you, you can't separate it. <laughs> it is who I am. Um, <laughs> yeah. well, it's, I mean, you're, you, you have a, a huge total and everything, but like, I honestly don't know. I mean, like we know Jen Thompson, like there's a couple of other moms out there that are really yes. strong, but I mean, like currently doing it podium at worlds in the open, you know, yeah. like, I don't know any others. So like, that's why it, it, we have to, I, that, cause I, I actually don't think about it that much, but I mean, it's like, I always have Since, to back in my head and remind myself like, and you're a new mom too. Yeah. I think I, I, it is important to me. Like, I guess why I mentioned that is like, it is important to me to like include that as part of like, no, no, no. Like I don't want that to be separate because it is who I am yeah. because it means a lot to me because it took me a lot to get back here, like postpartum, not just physically, the physical part was probably the easier part, but like mentally to think I belong on this stage still, even in the season I'm in my life. Right. Yes, like just yes. because of X doesn't mean I'm not strong anymore. Like I can be even stronger. Um, and I think that's like, I really don't like to use the word empowering, but like it's empowering. Right. It um, is. and I think that it has a lot of different meanings for different people, depending on where they're at, but it's like, whatever that stage is to you, it doesn't mean you can't do it anymore. Um, mm -hmm. you just gotta like get after it. But I also, I do know, I, and I, I want to give a shout out because it's incredible. You know, uh, Natalie Bubs, I don't know her real name, the Australian uh -huh. powerlifter that has a ridiculous deadlift. Yes. She also has a very young child. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. But shout that's cool. Like, shout I love that. Too. See how yeah. I know that? Because <laughs> it's like a small, hey, you know, it's but a like small community. I think it's an important thing to bring up because of what you're saying. Like it yeah. is possible. And like, whatever your world champion, oh, championship stage is like you can still have that yeah you know 
I mean, I just remember listening to all the people's stories on the road to Sheffield last year. And I, and I just think like you have a story that will yeah. resonate. Like that's just as, as good as anyone else's story out there. That would be just as inspiring. And like I said, it's not just, in, I mean, there are seriously like so many moms out there, like, like the number, I don't even know, like how many people are in the world, but half of them are moms basically. So it's like, you know, um, it, it would be inspiring. It would be, it can reach a really, really big audience. So I think hopefully they'll look, take that into consideration. And I mean, not to mention just on paper, the numbers speak for themselves as well, you know, like, and with where you're going, like, just imagine where your numbers are going to be by come February, you know? So just put that out there. It's like, you're going to be right there with those other ladies as well. So, and I mean, you know, um, no, I mean, I think we'll just leave it at that. Like, you know, the, the fact that it would be such an inspiring story. Um, it's just, it would be, it'd be awesome. So, all right. Um, any final thoughts, anything else you want to say about that final case for Sheffield? I think we've got I mean, a pretty much an open and shut case here, right? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, I think so. It's pretty, pretty obvious, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, just a, one last thing was just about world games. What, uh, oh, yeah. you know, when you look, look then beyond Sheffield, what do you think about the news that like you might be able to add a world games to your resume sometime down the road? I think that's really cool. You know, um, I mean, I've watched world games equipped, but obviously as a raw lifter, that is not necessarily looking to go equipped. It's something that's like, Oh, that seems really cool and fun, but it's not in my wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, and now it is right. So yeah. like, um, to me, world is very special. Like it's its own special thing. And it's hard to describe unless you go and you experience being at world. Um, yeah. and that was very important to me. And like world games is like the step above that. Right. Um, so I think it's a, again, like a really, another thing that's a really great for the sport. And it also gives like those people that are the best of the best, like another goal to strive for, mm -hmm. which only makes people push to get better. And I think that's important. Yeah. I mean, if worlds is as crazy as it is, like, I can only imagine like when you have all these other athletes from all mm -hmm. these other sports, so many more countries, um, like all together in like an athlete village, like Olympic style, Olympic village style setting. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, again, like, I mean, like you said, I feel the same way, like not being as invested in, uh, equipped lifting in the past. I watched world games right. and stuff, but didn't really think about it too much after that. It's like, okay, cool. But, um, wow. Like now the opportunities are endless. Like, like how big could world games get? Like we right. see things like Sheffield, we see how worlds this year was way bigger. Worlds next year will be bigger. Sheffield this year will be even bigger than it was last year. By the time world games rolls around in 20 right. summer, 2025, like the sport will be so much bigger. Classic is so much bigger. Raw is so much bigger. I mean, it's like, wow, like this could be like the cherry on top of the cherry of Sheffield yeah. and worlds and all that. Yeah. And there's something special, like every time you go and you compete against, you know, people that you have so much respect for, but you don't necessarily, you've never met before, or, or this is the only time you get to see them. Like there's always something special that's going to happen on the platform. Yeah. You know, totally, totally. Well, it's exciting times. Um, it, it's cool that you're, you're in the sport like this time when it's like blowing up the way that it is. And, um, congratulations again, amazing performance at the world championships. Thank you. And, um, you're a huge inspiration for everyone. So, all right, with that, um, we'll go ahead and wrap this up and, um, Thank you to everyone who's listening. Is there anyone that you want to thank or anything like that before we cut it? Uh, I mean, I'd like to thank my people. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I definitely want to thank like Kelly. Thank Kelly. I think Brian, I think yeah. SBD. I think yeah. they do so much for the sport and for me, they've done a lot personally and I really appreciate that. Uh, but, and again, thank you guys. Like me to team in powerlifting America. That was really fast, but I wanted to get it in there. Boom. We got it. Probably no one right. understood that. <laughs> no, no. Everyone understood it. All right. With that, we're out of here. Thanks everyone for listening. Peace out. Bye.